Okay guys, in this video we are going to be talking about the kinetic molecular theory of gases. Uh, KMT is based upon um, several assumptions and it's used to describe perfect gas behavior. So the first, uh, the first assumption of, of the kinetic molecular theory is that gas molecules move randomly that is, they're moving in different directions and they have different speeds. Um, they do uh, interact with one another through very brief collisions. So two molecules might hit each other, but then they're going to bounce off one another elastically so they won't lose any energy in those collisions. Another assumption about the kinetic molecular theory relates to the size of molecules. Uh, because the distance between molecules is typically much, much larger than the size of molecules, we can treat them like they're point particles. So we can essentially neglect all effects related to molecular size. Uh, finally, uh, where the theory gets its namesake from, it's assumed that interactions between molecules are also negligible. And this can also be justified due to the fact that the distance between the molecules is very large. In order for the molecules to interact with one another, they need to be somewhat close to each other. So if, if gas molecules are far apart, then essentially you can neglect all potential energy interactions between the gas molecules. So the molecules have only kinetic energy. Okay, so. Uh, Molecular kinetic energy is the only contribution to the total energy of a perfect gas, at least as far as the kinetic molecular theory goes. So those are the primary assumptions about the kinetic molecular theory. Uh, what are some of the implications? Well, one thing that you can do is you can predict the ideal gas equation of state. And so that's what the next uh, several slides are all about. Okay, so in, in kinetic molecular theory, gas pressure is due to the average cumulative force of molecules colliding with the container walls. Okay, so a molecule, molecules are constantly hitting the walls of the container, and it's the average cumulative force that gives rise to the pressure that the gas exerts on the container walls. And so what I'm going to be doing is walking you through uh, how to calculate the, um, or how to, how to show uh, that the pressure uh, is related to the number density and the average molecular kinetic energy. Okay, so we're going to start with pressure is an average. That's what these symbols here mean. Okay, so we're going to take the average of whatever's inside. It's the average um, force per unit area associated with a number of collisions. Okay, so we're going to consider uh, what gas molecules are, we're going to consider both the force and the number of collisions that a molecule with a given speed will make. Okay, so the force is going to be determined by uh, the speed of the molecules as well as the number of molecules with that particular speed. And then we're going to average over all speeds. So let's start with the force. So down here, we're looking at the collision force of a molecule with some velocity vx. I should say velocity component. So uh, let's take a look at this picture. So here's our x direction. And we're going to be considering the force that a molecule that collides with this wall exerts on that wall. Okay, so that's why we're thinking about the x direction. So, so this force is a function of that velocity component. Well, from physics, there is a result from Newton's equations that the force uh, can be calculated as a change in the momentum with respect to time. Okay, so over the course of this collision, this molecule 
is going to be colliding with the wall and bouncing off. So we're going to look at the change in the momentum of the molecule over a short time interval during which the molecule makes a collision. So there's some delta T involved. Okay, so during the collision, or I should say before the collision, the molecule has momentum of mass times its velocity, which in this arrangement, uh, the velocity is positive, the velocity component is positive. So the initial momentum is mvx, and the final momentum after the collision because it's an elastic collision, the value of the momentum is the same, however, the sign is the opposite. Okay, so the change in the momentum would be this momentum minus the initial momentum. Okay, and so that's where we get this change in the momentum is two times the mass times the velocity along the x component. All right, so this is our estimate for the force that a molecule exists, exerts on the wall when it undergoes a collision. We see that it's linearly proportional to the speed along the x, x uh, coordinate. Well, the next part that we want to think about is the number of collisions as a function of that speed. Okay, so we're going to look at another figure to help us understand its formula. So in a given time interval delta t, molecules traveling with the particular vx can go a certain distance. So the, the maximum, you know, the distance that a molecule can travel in a given time interval dt is the speed in that direction times delta t, right? Speed times the time gives you a distance. Okay, so a molecule can only travel so far. So how many molecules will hit the wall? is going to be related to how many molecules are close enough to the wall to hit it, if that makes sense. So there's a certain distance over which a molecule can travel. And in a finite time interval, either it will or it won't be able to reach the wall in that delta t. So we need to count up the number of molecules that will be able to hit the wall and disregard the rest. Okay, so there's a distance you know, over which the molecules will be able to reach the wall. And then there's an area associated with the surface area of the, of the wall. And so, you know, the combination of that distance and the area gives us a volume. So we can think of this cube here as a collision volume. That is, any molecules in this volume that are traveling in the right direction with speed vx will strike the wall. Any molecules not in that volume won't strike the wall. Okay, so we have, uh, we have a way of calculating the volume of molecules with speed vx that will collide with the wall. So what we need to do is to take that volume that we've got and multiply it by the number density of the gas. So the volumes will cancel out and you'll be left with the number of molecules that collide that have a specific velocity. The factor of 2 comes from the fact that half the molecules in this collision volume will be going towards the wall and the other half will be traveling away from the wall. So we're essentially getting rid of the molecules that are traveling in the opposite direction and won't collide with the wall for that reason. Okay, so this, this term here represents the number of molecules with speed vx that will collide with the wall. And so we take these two expressions and we multiply them together to give us this expression here. You'll notice that the factor of 2 cancels that factor of 2 you see that the delta t time interval also cancels out. And so we can then factor out the constants, the number of molecules divided by the volume. So this is the number density, and then the mass of the molecules. We're simply taking an average of vx squared, right? You get vx from this term, and then you get vx from this factor as well. And so you multiply the two, you square them, and then we take the average 
of that squared velocity. So this, this quantity means to count up over all of the molecules, take the Vx value, square it, and then you know um, divide by the total number of molecules. So it's an average, the average speed squared along the x direction. Well, there's nothing special about the x direction. And you can think of, of course, velocity is a vector. And you can write the average velocity squared as being a sum, or this, so this would be actually be the average speed squared. So v here represents the speed. Um, the average speed squared of the molecule would be equal to a sum of the average speed along x, the average speed along y, and the average speed along z, all squared. And because space in the kinetic molecular theory is isotropic, meaning there's no preferred direction for the molecules to be traveling, each of these three values is going to be equal. And so you can write the average speed squared as being three times the average speed along x squared. And that gives us a way to remove this vx squared and just replace it with the average speed squared. But there's going to be a factor of 3 involved. Right? So you just solve this equation here for, v, for the average vx squared. And you wind up with this 1 third average of v squared in the, uh, in the equation. Now if you look carefully at what we have here, we've got mass and we've got average speed squared. We can write that in terms of the average kinetic energy of the molecules. So kinetic energy is one half times mass times speed squared. If you're considering the averages, then the average kinetic energy is just one half times the mass of the molecules times the average speed squared. And so that's what we have, uh, that's what we've done here. The only thing that we're missing is this factor of 2. So you need to multiply and divide by a factor of 2. And then we can replace these factors with the average kinetic energy. So what we've shown in this analysis is that the pressure of a sample of gas is proportional to the number density of that gas and the average kinetic energy of the molecules. Uh, now what we're going to be thinking about is, is that distribution of speeds and the distribution of kinetic energies. So in order to go, let me go back a step, in order to go further with this expression we need to be able to calculate that quantity. And so that's what, the, or we could calculate that quantity. You know, they're equivalent to one another, these two expressions. So whichever one you want. You need to be able to take statistical averages of gas molecules. And so that's what the next set of slides are about. We need to know, in order to take a statistical average, you need to know what is the distribution of speeds. What is the distribution of kinetic energies? That's what the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution uh, does for us. So. Molecules exhibit a distribution of, of velocities, a distribution of speeds, a distribution of kinetic energies. The Maxwell-Boltzmann dist distribution is that distribution. And it shows us that uh, gas molecules exhibit a distribution of velocities, and then that distribution broadens, meaning it spreads out, when temperature increases, and when the mass of the molecules involved decrease. So the I have a little bit of a typo here. That I don't actually, well, yeah, I don't actually need this I here. So let's pretend that that I right here is not there, but we do need this one. So this represents the distribution of velocities. So I've used a, a bold-faced V here to denote that it's a vector quantity. And so this would represent the um, probability of finding a molecule with a velocity 
between v and v plus dv. And there are three components to the velocity, and they are independent of one another. That is, the, the speed along x is independent of the speed along y and the speed along z. And so you can write this distribution function as a product of the speeds, or I should say the velocities along each component. So the i here, we're, we're doing a multiplication. That's what this large pi symbol means. It's a product. We are multiplying the distribution of the x component of velocity times the distribution of the y component of velocity times the distribution of the z component of velocity all together. And then each of those, each of those x, y, and z distribution functions, they're all identical to one another because space is symmetric. Here is the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution of velocities. Okay, so this is a, a probability distribution function. It represents the fraction of molecules uh, with uh, you know, let's say i is x with an x velocity component between vx and vx plus dvx. It's a Gaussian function, okay, and so the Gaussian function is this exponential minus and then the independent variable squared, so e to the minus v squared is the is called a Gaussian type of of, uh, of function. It looks like a bell curve. Uh, the, as it states here, and as we'll show more explicitly later, that the distribution function, that bell curve, its width will broaden as temperature increases, and its width will, will also broaden as the mass um, decreases. So let's take a look at so before we move on to these, I'm just going to go ahead and make a quick sketch of, of what we were looking at. So here what I'll plot is the distribution of velocities as a function of velocity. And so it's going to be a curve that kind of does this. I'm not drawing it perfectly here, but it more or less, it's symmetric about vi equals zero. That's what I meant by a bell curve. And what I want to point out, one, one very important thing to note about the distribution of velocities is that velocity can take on negative and positive values. And so you see that the distribution is symmetric about a velocity of zero, which means that you have an equal number of molecules traveling to the right as you do that are traveling to the left, right? Because this would be a positive velocity, this would be a negative velocity. The distribution function that we're looking at here, the area, underneath this curve. It represents the total probability of finding a particle with some velocity. And so that, that needs to be normalized. That distribution function needs to be normalized to unity. That's what this first integral here represents. This integral tells us that there is a probability of finding a molecule with some velocity. Um, the next integral that's given represents the average or mean velocity of this distribution. To calculate the mean velocity, what you do is you take the function, you take the distribution function here, and you multiply it by this independent variable, the velocity along the ith direction in this case and then you integrate that guy. This is a weighted sum. Okay? You're taking every little possible velocity you have, you could have, and then you're adding up the number of molecules that have that particular velocity. And what you find, because of the symmetry of the function, 
that because you have an equal number of molecules that are moving with positive velocity and an equal number of molecules that are moving with negative velocity, you find that the two sides of the distribution cancel out such that the average velocity is in fact zero. It's not because that the molecules don't have velocity, it's just because there's an equal number of molecules moving with positive velocity as there are moving with negative velocity, and so they cancel out to zero. Uh, the last integrals, or the last expressions, represent the width of the distribution. So how broad is the distribution? And that's denoted by this sigma i in this case. And in general, this is how you calculate the uh, variance, as it's called, of a distribution. You need to take the average of the squared quantity, which is represented by this integral here, minus the average squared. Now the average was zero, so we have zero squared here. So you need to you know, calculate this integral. That is, you have to take this function right here, and you plug it in to this expression, and you, you do the, you go through the calculus of calculating that. Uh, I won't take us through that uh, explicitly, but but that's what you do. And in the end, you'll get an expression that looks like this. Okay. And so, if we take the square root of this expression, so sigma i would be the square root of kt over m. This sigma i is related to the width. the width of the function. How, how broad is the distribution? How spread out are the velocities? Are they very tightly focused around zero or uh, is there a big spread to the velocities? Well that spread it increases with temperature so the higher the temperature the larger sigma, the larger the width and then the larger the molar mass the smaller sigma so as mass increases the distribution will get narrower. Uh, what we'll do next is we'll turn our attention not to the distribution of velocities. We're going to turn back, we're going to turn towards the distribution of speeds. Now, um, speed is a different quantity than velocity. Speed is the magnitude of velocity. And so what we do is we need to take the, well, let's look at this picture here. So this uh, this, a point on this, uh, on this sphere represents a possible velocity, right? So here, this is a vector that points to the edge of the sphere. It has some x component, it has a y component, and it has a z component. Okay, so this, this is the velocity vector. Now, when you turn your attention to the question of speed, you don't really care about the orientation of the velocity you want to know the magnitude of the vector. And so we're sort of changing the question here. Uh, instead of what's the probability that a gas molecule has a certain vx velocity, we want to know what is the probability that the molecule has a certain speed. Okay, now speed is always positive because it's the magnitude of the vector. And what's being illustrated here in this, with this sphere is that when you ask what's the probability of finding a molecule with a particular speed between v and v plus dv, what you're asking yourself is what's the probability of finding the molecule in this little, in this shell of thickness dv. And there's a mathematical transformation you can do. Uh, it, essentially it involves transforming from the Cartesian coordinates of x, y, and z to a spherical polar coordinate system and then you integrate over all of the orientational effects. So, so here, this represents the speed, the magnitude of the velocity vector. And then theta and phi, these are angles that would tell you how this velocity vector is oriented in space. So essentially what you do is you integrate all of those out, and what you're left with is called the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution of speeds, and I've used a lowercase f to represent that function. It will be a function of the speed. Uh, it also has a 
a Gaussian form in the sense that there's an e to the minus speed squared, but then it is multiplied by this speed squared in front. Okay, so it's not quite a, a Gaussian. Notice the domain of the distribution of speeds. It's not from negative infinity to infinity, it's from zero to infinity. And that's because this represents the magnitude of speed and has nothing to do with the direction. So this quantity here, v, f of v dv, it represents the fraction of molecules in your gas sample that have a speed between v and v plus dv. Contrast that with capital F here, which represents the fraction of molecules with a velocity component between v and v plus dv, where, where that v goes from minus infinity to infinity. In this expression, v goes from 0 to infinity. Here what you're looking at in this graph is um, plots of the Maxwell distribution of speeds for, we'll start with different temperatures. So this blue curve here, notice that when you go down to zero speed, there's zero probability of finding molecules that are moving with speed of zero. It peaks at some, you know, most probable speed. And then as you go start looking for larger and larger speeds, you find that the number of molecules drops down. So at very, very high speeds, there's a low probability of finding molecules with such high speeds. Well, this would be a low temperature distribution. As you increase the temperature of your gas sample, what you find is that the distribution, the peak of the distribution shifts to higher speeds. So that means as you increase the temperature of the gas, the average gas molecule is going to be moving faster. Furthermore, you find that the distribution broadens at higher temperatures. So you get a, a larger breadth of speeds at higher temperatures as well. And that's exemplified also in the yellow curve, where you go to even, even higher temperatures. Uh, the effect of molecular mass is, is, is the opposite. Okay? Um, if you have a large molecular mass, you'll find that the distribution is narrow. And for the same temperature, comparing that to a, a gas with a low molecular mass, say, for example, helium. So maybe we would call this, at, a, at 300 degrees Kelvin, this would be the curve for xenon. This would be the curve for helium. Right? So at the same temperature, a, a light gas will have a much broader distribution and an average higher speed than a heavier gas. Uh, we can play the same kinds of games with integrals that we did for the uh, distribution of velocities. Here, this integral represents the probability of finding a molecule with a speed between v1 and v2. So you have to take that distribution of speeds function and then integrate it between these two values. And that'll tell you the probability of finding the molecule with the speed between these two values. If you take v1 all the way down to 0 and v2 all the way up to infinity, you're asking the question, what's the probability of finding a molecule with any speed? That probability is equal to 1. And so the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution of speeds is normalized to, to to unity. Uh, what I'm illustrating here, this is just taking, you can calculate the average value or the so-called expectation value of any function. So any function of speed, you take the distribution of speeds, multiply by that function, integrate over the entire domain, and then that gives you the average of whatever that quantity is. Here is a graphic illustrating that first equation, so the probability of finding a molecule 
with the speed between v1 and v2? What's the probability of finding a molecule with the speed between v1 and v2? It's the area underneath the distribution function. And then, as I was saying before, if you drop the velocity to zero and you increase v2 all the way up to infinity, the area underneath the curve would be one. Uh, in these equations, we're making use of the expectation value. Uh, so for example, well, actually what we're doing is we're, we're deriving a different distribution. It's a related distribution. It's the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution of kinetic energy. So you can take this distribution of speeds here, right? We've got a mass speed squared. You've, you've also got the one half. So in the, you know, in this Gaussian function, you've essentially got kinetic energy. Uh, we need to play a little game, a few games with mass uh, over here, but we can eventually turn this into kinetic energy as well. And the result is this distribution function. So f of e k is the dis is the distribution of kinetic energy. So what is the probability of finding a molecule with a, protect with a particular kinetic energy e k? Okay, so it's this exponential e to the minus e k, and then you've got this e k square root in front. Kinetic energy also varies between zero and infinity. And this is what we wanted to do, right? If you recall from our previous, uh, the previous topic um, that we showed that the pressure was proportional to the average kinetic energy, now we're in a position to actually calculate the average kinetic energy for a gas. And so we take, it's, it's an expectation value, so we want to calculate the expectation value of Ek. So we take the distribution function and multiply by Ek crank through the calculus and you wind up with this expression here the average kinetic energy of a gas molecule depends only on temperature it's three halves times kt so this is the average kinetic energy of uh, a molecule in a gas this was the result that we had previously from kinetic molecular theory now using the Maxwell-Boltzmann distributions we take this average kinetic energy substituted in and we get that the pressure times volume is number of moles times the Boltzmann number of molecules times the Boltzmann's constant times temperature. If we rewrite the number of molecules as number of moles times Avogadro's number, and then recognize that Avogadro's number times K is the gas constant, finally we derive the perfect gas law using kinetic molecular theory. Okay, and so that's one of the neat things about kinetic molecular theory. Using a few assumptions and, you know, some fairly sophisticated mathematics, you can, you can derive the ideal gas law. Um, since we have the, the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, let's talk about some of its characteristics. Uh, one way to characterize a distribution is to calculate various average quantities. And so what we'll look at here are some of the different average speeds. And the first one that I want to um, introduce is the most probable speed. Okay. The most probable speed corresponds to the speed where the distribution function peaks. So here's the, the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution of speeds. The value of the peak corresponds to the most probable speed. And Mathematically, you can determine that by taking the derivative of the distribution of speeds with respect to speed, setting it equal to zero, and then solving for uh, the most probable speed. Recall from calculus that when a function peaks like this, the derivative slope of the curve at the peak is zero. So by taking the derivative of the distribution function, setting it equal to zero, and then solving for the value of speed, that gives us what we call the most probable speed. Um, I do want to point out, uh, before I forget, that in these, um, in these formulas here, you want to be using SI units. Okay, So in, in this formula, this is the molar mass of the gas. You want to express that for these types of problems. You want to express it in terms of kilograms per per mole. 
and if you prefer you can also work with um, kilograms per molecule uh, using these conversion factors here. So if you don't like to write it in terms of R over over molar mass, you could write it in terms of K over molecular mass. Uh, the average speed is found by taking speed times the distribution function and doing the integral and you get a very similar expression. Right? It differs by a couple of constants but the important point is how these speeds depend on temperature and molar mass. In both cases, the speeds will increase with temperature and they will decrease with increasing molar mass. Uh, let's see. This here's another important speed, the root mean squared speed. Right? So it's the speed squared. The mean is the average, and then the root is the square root, the one half. That's why it's called the root mean squared. So you're taking the average of speed squared. So you take speed squared times the distribution function. Then you do the integral. That's the mean part. That's the average part. And then you take the square root. Okay. So you work your way through this calculus, and you wind up with this expression right here. Again, it increases with temperature and it decreases with increasing molar mass. Uh, the, next, the next speed I wanted to introduce was call, is called the relative speed. Uh, and so it, it represents the speed, um, the mean speed with which one molecule approaches another molecule of the same kind, but this takes into account the fact that the other molecule is also moving. And so that's what it's meant by a relative speed. Okay. Uh, and so this is sort of depicted in these different pictures. You know, if you've got two molecules that are both moving in the same direction at the same speed, the relative speed between them is zero, right? The distance between them will never change if they're both moving in the same direction with the same speed. If they're moving with the same speed but in opposite directions, the relative speed to one another is actually twice what their speed is. And if they're moving at this 90 degree angle, then their relative speed would be um, the square root of 2 times what their speed is. This is what's meant by relative speed. And if you average over all possible orientations, overall, you wind up with this result, that the relative speed between two molecules of the same kind that are approaching each other is the square root of 2 times the average speed. Uh, the situation is it's a little bit more complicated when you have two different kinds of molecules. When you have two different kinds of molecules, you have to take into account the different masses. And what you find there is that the relative speed is given by this expression, where this quantity mu is called the reduced mass. It's the mass of molecule A times the mass of molecule B divided by the total uh, of both masses. In any case, all of these different speeds, it's still temperature in the numerator and something like mass in the denominator. Well, in this pair of, um, of problems, what you're being asked to do is to calculate the, the average speed. And so I'm going to go ahead and do this for one of the speeds. I won't do all of them. Uh, I'm going to calculate the mean speed for you just to show you how it's done. And so in this case, we're calculating the mean speed of uh, nitrogen molecules. Okay, and so it's going to be the square root of 8RT over pi m, where m is the molar mass. And what I suggest you do is you want to put everything in SI units. And for masses, that's kilograms. So it's going to be 8 times 8.314 for the gas constant. That has units of joules, uh, joules per uh, mole Kelvin. And then for the temperature, we're at 25 degrees Celsius, and so that's going to be 298 Kelvin. Divide by pi. And then the molar mass for nitrogen, we're going to take that to be 28 
times 10 to the minus 3 kilograms per mole. And then we're going to take everything to the 1 half power. And what I'm getting is about 475, and the units are going to be meters per second. I'll go through that in a second. Um, what I wanted to point out first was this is a very typical value for gas molecules at ordinary temperatures. Okay? So they move very quickly. Uh, this is around the speed of a bullet, um, uh, which is typical for gas molecules. Uh, let's look at the units a little bit more closely. Uh, I've been doing this long enough that I know that if I put SI units in and I have my equation correct, I'm going to get the SI units that I want out. Let's actually prove that. So we've got, uh, just, just looking at the units, we have joules per mole, Kelvin, that's coming from the gas constant, and then we had units of Kelvin, pi has no units, and then we have units of kilograms per mole, and all of that is to the one-half power. So we see that the kelvins cancel, the moles cancel. We've got joules per kilogram. So let's expand the units of joules. Uh, a joule is a newton meter, and a newton meter, or a newton is going to be a kilogram times acceleration, meters per second squared. So that's the newton's part. Here's the meter part. So this is one joule right here. And then we're dividing out by the kilograms and then we're taking that to the half power. So the kilograms cancel, we've got meters squared per second squared, you take the square root, and indeed you get the, uh, you get the meters per second uh, that we wanted. Now, there's nothing more complicated about the other formulas. Uh, they're just slightly different, but they're, they're calculated in exactly same, the same way, so I'm gonna leave these as an exercise for you to try. Uh, we're gonna move on to the last a uh, couple of ideas here. So we're going to talk a little bit more about collisions between molecules. And the reason we want to think about molecules colliding with one another is that uh, molecular collisions are important for chemical reactions. Uh, they're also important for uh, how molecules move around, so transport properties. Uh, and so the next couple of slides introduce um, some key concepts. The first one is called collision frequency, and it's represented by the lowercase letter z. It has units of collisions per unit time, so 1 over seconds. Uh, and this is an average quantity, so the average number of collisions per unit time. And so what we have here, it's similar to what we did before, where we've got now number of collisions. This is now between molecules, number of collisions between molecules in a particular time interval. So what we want to do is calculate the average number of collisions in a given time interval. We'll start with this figure here. Uh, the way I like to think about gas molecules colliding with one another is like playing a game of billiards. So here we've got our cue ball, it's moving, uh, it basically moves through a tube, okay? And so in a given amount of time, this molecule will travel a certain distance depending on its relative velocity. So the length of this tube is determined by the velocity and the time interval over which we allow the, the molecule to move. Now, if there's any molecules within this tube, then they are going to get hit by the molecule. If they're outside of the tube, then they won't. So what we want to do is play a little game like we did before. We're going to calculate the volume of the tube and multiply it by the number density of the molecules. And that'll tell us how many molecules collided with this molecule. And so that's what's given here. So what we've done here is substituted in for 
the number of collisions, we've substituted in the number density times the volume of that collision tube. This was the this v relative times delta t. This is the length of the tube, and then sigma represents the cross section of the tube. Right? Think of this as the volume of a cylinder. Right? We have some surface area here times the length. That gives us the volume. The surface area is determined by the size of the molecule, how big the molecule is. And so it's essentially pi d squared, where d is the radius of the molecule that we're talking about. So anyway, that's what's going on here. You see that the delta t in the denominator is going to cancel with the delta t in the numerator. And so we're left with this expression here involving the cross-section of the molecule and the relative speed and the number density. If you like, you can use the ideal gas equation of state and replace the number density with something related to pressure and temperature. So there's two different versions of the collision frequency. We'll look at both. For the case where um, we're considering how does the collision frequency change with temperature when the number density is constant. So if you have a constant density of gas, what you'll find is that the collision frequency is going to increase with temperature via the relative speed. Right? All of the speeds that we've looked at, they all increase as t to the one half. And so if you increase temperature, the speed increases. Therefore, the number of collisions per unit time will increase. That's when the number density is constant. Um, let's keep temperature constant now. Okay, so let's suppose temperature is fixed. Then we're going to look at how does the collision frequency change with pressure. Well, the, the number density is determined by the pressure. And so at constant temperature, if you increase the pressure, the collision frequency will also increase. Right? That makes sense. If you have a high pressure, that means there's more molecules around. Therefore, you're more likely to hit the molecules. Uh, for this first part, the higher the temperature, the faster the molecules are moving, the longer this collision tube, the more likely you are to run into a molecule. And so that's why the collision frequency increases. Okay, so these relationships are important. How does the collision frequency depend on temperature? How does it depend on pressure? You have to be careful when looking at this equation because pressure depends upon temperature. And so you wouldn't want to use this one to establish how does the how does the collision frequency increase with temperature? You need to use this one. A couple more quantities. Uh, the mean free path refers to the average distance a molecule travels before it collides with another molecule. That's what we mean by the free path, the path along which it travels and it doesn't collide with something. So how far does a molecule get before it hits something else? That's what we call the mean free path. It would have units of meters. You might convert that to nanometers, or just depends on what, what range we're at. Uh, the symbol lambda is used. Uh, you can relate the mean free path to the relative speed and the collision frequency. And so substituting in expressions for these, you'll get this result, which shows us, uh, and this second result, which shows us that, um, uh, just looking at this one here, when volume is constant, lambda is independent of temperature. Okay, so, so from this expression alone, when volume is constant, the, uh, the mean free path does not depend on temperature at all. Um, looking at this second expression and making a substitution for the number density, right? This is volume over n, so this is 1 over the number density. Uh, if you substitute in the ideal gas law, for that, uh, what you'll find is that lambda decreases with um, increasing pressure. And that makes sense. The higher the pressure, the more molecules there are, uh, the less far the molecule will get before it collides with another molecule. Right? When you've got lots of molecules present, you're not going to get very far before you collide with another one. So that's the idea with this, with this second relationship here lambda decreases with pressure. Finally, um, you can calculate the average time between collisions is simply 1 over the collision frequency. 
uh, which is kind of a neat, um, a neat calculation. So, you know, given the collision frequency, just take the reciprocal, and you can calculate the average time between collisions, and then the speed, the mean free path, and the average time between collisions. They can all be related to each other through this uh, equation here, which looks very much like just the definition of speed. Speed is a distance divided by a time. And so that's, uh, I think that's kind of a cute formula to look at. Uh, let's see, this last, um, this last problem here just has us do some calculations. Um, and so it's, it's, not too, um, it's not too tricky to do these. Uh, you just simply need to use these formulas and the values given and plug them in. Um, you know, they even give you the, they give you the cross section directly. It's 0.45 nanometers squared. They give you the relative speed. They give you the pressure. You just have to be careful to convert all of the units correctly. And what I recommend that you do is you make sure that you put all of your quantities in SI units before you do the calculations. Okay. And so the purpose of these is to just get a sense of what would be a typical lambda value and what would be a typical collision frequency uh, for molecules under these conditions. You're going to find that the collision frequency is rather large uh, and that the mean free path is, is fairly large. Um, the homework problems will have you change these conditions. Undoubtedly, they're going to have you do a low pressure um, calculation where you're going to find that the mean free path gets much, much larger and the number of collisions per unit time gets smaller. So uh, look to the homework to get some practice with these, with these uh, equations. I'm going to go ahead and, and stop this video here.